Welcome into Eastern Pan Am Talk, the Friday edition. Um, it's a beautiful day outside. We have uh, four. We had scheduled four old men for the, the, the first segment. Um, the real and, and we have organized body that's running. No, oh, excuse me. <laughs> that's not the right button. I want to welcome in Delegate Michael Height. Good morning. John Gilstrap. Good morning. Bill Stubblefield. You know, Mike Hornby, I feel so much safer after listening to that introduction of you. I feel something like out of Marvel Comics. Right. <laughs> and on the phone, we have Joe Ferretti. Joe, you there? I, I am here, and I'm just sitting here wondering if, if it's possible that the owner of the station can fire himself. <laughs> I have tried many times, but they won't give me unemployment, Joe. <laughs> and the severance package is pretty low. That's right. <laughs> you need a good lawyer. Yeah. So, uh, yesterday we'd mentioned that next week we'll be ha having a couple of city forums, and I just wanted to update people. I got a message from Rob. Um, Yvonne Jenkins will not, has not accepted our invitation. She will do an interview, but she, will, she, does, she does not want to do a forum in the presence of the current mayor. So that was kind of news to us. And the other person was Dennis Etherington refused to do a forum type um, thing. Thoughts well, on those? That's really unfortunate in both of their cases. I, I think so, too. And uh, we, we, we did try, but we will have interviews. Rob will do his best. You know that. Um, but um, it is what it is. I've never understood the resistance to just being heard and, and answering questions as, as they come up. And it's not like we have this battle um, debate. We kind of really make it easy on candidates, I feel, anyway, in, in the, the way we do things. We certainly do not want to embarrass. We do not try to embarrass. So. Yeah. So, um, hey, listen, can I put out a PSA real quick? Sure. For the people who live in Inwood, <clears throat> the ladies of my neighborhood are going out for a group uh, shooting lesson this morning. At, at, a, at a range that's out there, many of whom have never handled a pistol before. So I'm just saying, you know, stay low for, <laughs> <laughs> for the next few hours. Any sexist would say. Yeah, no, I just, you know, it's, it's I'm, everybody, I'm, there's a, I'm sure there's a good range safety officer, but, you know, just, just be aware. And I do want to... <laughs> that's sexist, John. I do want to apo apologize <laughs> To Larry Schultz, because I don't think I told him we were starting at eight. So. I know you did not. <laughs> so, I might have <laughs> told him about six minutes ago. <laughs> so Larry will be joining us. We, we didn't <laughs> we didn't omit him on purpose, but when he gets here, he'll slide in, and we all know what his subject is anyway. So we should be good. You don't think you'll be offended, do you? <laughs> Walking I, I, into I hope not. So why don't you start us off, Joe? Okay. Well, well, Mike, I, I listening to the show earlier this week, and uh, I think it was the same fellas uh, that are in the studio here this morning. Uh, you guys were talking a little bit about the tenor and tone of the campaigning uh, locally and some of the accusations, allegations uh, that were made. Uh, and, and we know what they were. I mean, was some of the candidates being referred to as, as a groomer and uh another candidate being accused of being supported by white supremacists and things of that nature. Uh, stuff that was, uh, I would term it kind of fairly ugly. And I think the comment was made that uh, we hope in two years this will be a little bit cleaned up and we'll do a little better job of this. And I had to chuckle to myself because I don't see that happening. I think it's going to go the other way. I think it's going to get worse as uh, AI, artificial intelligence, starts permeating throughout our lives and, and it will eventually bubble down into local politics and, and it'll become affordable for some of these uh, less than well-financed campaigns to utilize that kind of uh, politicking and that kind of, uh, uh, really, the software that's going to be available for use. Uh, this is going to devolve into something that we don't recognize in terms of our politics. And the reason I think this is, is the problem of the low information voter. Uh, this has been a problem for, for a long time. It seems to be getting worse. We see it with our voter turnout locally, where we, we really are doing poor. And we see it in terms of what campaigning is being done. Uh, it's a reflection on us, I think, as much as it is on those who sponsor some of these 
questionable uh, political ads. It's a reflection on, on what us and what they think works, what resonates with the local population. That, that referring to somebody as a groomer is going to somehow have an impact. And it, it's hard to say whether it did or not, but it, the reflection on us is poor because we are low information voters. We don't read. We don't t- uh, really look at credible news sources. We're lazy. We get our news off the Internet in five-minute sound bites, and we think we understand that issue completely after we hear this information. So it, the campaigning is going to be uh, getting a lot worse, and it's going to be, uh, again, I think, uh, symptomatic of a problem that we have in society, and that is we are not engaged. We just don't understand or know things. We don't research things. And we suddenly form these opinions about matters of which we know little about. So I am, I mean, I I want you guys to try to correct me here or or try to instill a little bit more confidence, but I am very negative in terms of where our politicking is going. I think it's going to devolve into something that is is just, I mean, I, I, I long for the days where we wore a button. (laughs) <laughs> on her lapel supporting a candidate. Those days are long past, uh, and I, I fear that it's just going to get worse and worse. People are not going to run for office. Uh, and I, I think it's a major problem going forward, and I'm, I'm hoping you guys can convince me otherwise, but I just see it in a very negative light, and I think it's, uh, it's going to be a hard problem to tame. Bill? Yeah, Joe, I don't know what program you listened to last week that felt that uh, people saying it's going to get better. Uh, my sense, and everybody I've talked to agree with you, it's going to get much worse in the fall, and in 26, it's going to blow it away, what we saw this year. Now, we're, I think we're on a trend to get things worse and worse. The low voter, low information voter, low voter turnout, and I assume they're one and the same, seems to be more intense or more developed uh, in Berkeley and Jefferson County than as other parts of the state. We had 17.3% and Jefferson had, I think, 20% of voters that voted. Yet the western part of the state had low turnout, but much more reason than what we had. They had over 40% in most cases. So, yeah, we're the kind of unique as far as the low voter turnout. Negative ads. I think we can, I think negative ads do hurt. They may, they, I mean, hurt with our, gym, our general image. Whether they have any real effect on the campaign, I don't know. Uh, one that, uh, that won uh, was uh, local in 97th, Chris Anders. Uh, Chris did not run negative ads, uh, yet he won fairly handily. Uh, and you look at uh, more Capito. More Capito ran a couple of negative ads, but nothing compared to what Chris Miller and uh, Marcy ran. And their ads really got negative, yet more Capito made a reasonable showing. My, I guess what I've been saying, I've spent the last one or two minutes uh, telling you, Joe, I don't know what in the blaze is going on. <laughs> yes, <sir>. John. <laughs> I think there are two things that that, that are working here. First of all, everybody has the God-given right not to be informed about the issues. Some people, they go through their day and they don't care. I was talking to a guy yesterday, lives in Martinsburg. I asked him who he's going to vote for, and he didn't know that they had a mayor. You know, I had no idea who, who, who the but mayor was. But they had an election. And, yeah, and there's, yeah. An, and there's an election coming up, and that's fine. You know, that, that is his, his, his right. But that puts an additional responsibility on people who are engaged in, in politics to make sure that they're honest. Now, here's the, I think, it's a problem of courage. And we, as writ large, the body politic, we've stopped valuing honesty. People don't, don't call out the, the lies anymore because it makes us uncomfortable. We read the, 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 I'm not a big social media guy, but this is how these lies start is on social media. And, you know, if you jump in and have that courage to say, well, you know, that's not true, then the, the enemies of the person you're defending are now going to pile on you. And unless there are others who are willing to defend the truth teller and also tell the truth, it gets to be really lonely really quickly. 
So the easiest thing to do is just to stand back and watch. And it's not just on social media. We see these people, you know, from New York, the beatdowns on the subway platforms and all that. People would rather take pictures of it than get involved. It didn't used to be that way. And it, we, we, we celebrate apathy. And we celebrate the, the telling of lies. And we reward the telling of lies. It's as easy and as difficult as not doing that anymore. So it's, I don't think it's an issue of... It is an issue of changing the campaign, but it starts with stepping up and being courageous enough to do the right thing when when you're when you're faced with choices like this. You don't let your buddy hang out there and twist in the wind just because it makes you uncomfortable to step up and be next to him or her. Delegate Hype. I, I would agree with that, John. But the, the problem is we see. Um, we see more and more negative ads because people see them working. Um, and, and as long as they're working, they will continue. It'll just, it'll just get worse and worse and worse. Um, and that's one of the reasons that it's getting worse is because when somebody runs a negative ad and then uh, you see that ad work and that person get elected, then of course, the next time somebody's going to run even worse negative ad because they want to win too. And everybody thinks that the end justifies the means. Um, we talk about low voter, low voter turnout. I, before you go, can I ask a question on sure. that? Sure. Mm -hmm. Mike, that's what we like, uh, tend to think, that negative ads work. But the examples that I was using would suggest maybe the negative ads are not working to the level that we would suggest they do. <coughs> Well, you, you gave some good examples, yeah. Yeah. but I would also say Craig Blair didn't run a, a negative campaign, and he lost. And Pam Brush didn't run a negative campaign, and she lost. Now, Mort Capito didn't run a negative campaign, even, even though he had a good showing. He still lost. He lost to a an individual who ran negative campaign. Well, not probably his campaign itself didn't, but his pack that was backing him ran negative campaign. But if you try to choose that, Mike Folk ran a negative campaign and he lost. So you can find examples well, on both but sides. So did Tom yeah. Willis and he won. Yeah. So uh, you can you can give a lot of these examples. What I see right now is the negative campaigning is is, is working. Joe DeSoto ran a extremely negative campaign. There's a difference between and, and negative and... Incoherent. And, yeah, and, and dishonest. Yeah. Also but dishonest. That's, that's what I mean about it getting yeah. worse and worse yeah. and worse, is, is if, if people see it working, then they they step it up. You know, I got to be... I got to run a more negative campaign than the other person ran. And when you talk about low voter turner, turnout, percentage-wise, Berkeley County did have a low voter turnout. But you know, since I've been in politics, and I know you do too, the night of the vote, we're looking at what, what did my district do? How many votes came out? And I'm not seeing a whole lot of difference in the total number of well, votes. I, I think it's in your in growing. your precinct definitely is a voting precinct, but I think in, in my precinct it was way, way down. It, but I've got a lot more Democrats in my but, district. But so. I don't think it was any more down than it has been in the past. So well, however many votes you got this time, that's about how many voters came out last time and the time before. But the growth of our county, the percentage is dropping because the growth of the county. So there's more people out there to vote. But this, it's the same people going to the polls. So how are you affecting them? Well, I think negative ads seem to be affecting I think in them. Berkeley County, we do have a lot of independents, and we do have a lot of Democrats. I know we're still very much a conservative county, but there were a lot of Democrats that just did not show up at all because there was just nobody on the ballot. Right. Right. Well, that's absolutely true. The, yeah. the, the Democrats didn't show up as much. Larry, sorry for... Not informing you that we're starting at eight, but well, welcome. You did. Uh, I was in Berkeley Springs at <laughs> seven fifty-eight, <laughs> and I got the word that the show was starting in two minutes. So you got here in twenty twenty-three <laughs> minutes. I'm guessing you were speeding. No, did no. Did you take a helicopter? <laughs> Actually, I was uh, on the road by the time it beat, but I knew I was not going to make it. I see the Smokey and the Bandits thing with the. With 
with the day troopers up on the side. Of the road and <laughs> well, they were blocking the other people because it's so important that I get to this radio station. So you obviously heard Joe's question. What's your thoughts? Um, I didn't hear Joe's question because the radio on my car doesn't work that well. <laughs> but it had to do with negative ads. Negative That's ads, it. negative campaigning. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think when... The, the further you are from a general election, the more definitive that stuff is. When we get to the general, to the extent there are local competitive races of any kind, when we get to the general, I don't think they'll be quite as effective because people think more about it. Most people, when they hear from their mom or their brother-in-law that, hey, Voting's on Tuesday, they're like, whoa, <laughs> what is this? What are we voting for? And because most people don't follow politics anywhere near as closely like we as we do. And so I, I don't yeah. think he, they pay a lot of attention. In I, I think this primary was especially different because there were four giant names at the top of the ticket who spent exorbitant amounts of money. I mean, this is the first time we've had a primary like this. Well, in a three of them did. Well, I mean, you can say Mac didn't spend a lot of money, but $600,000 is more than anybody spent for years and years and years. So even that 600000 that Mac spent is a lot of money across the state. And you know, when you add in Miller and Moore and, uh, and Marcy, it's... I mean, it's but I don't know that that had anything to do with how negative the campaigns were. I think if it had just been a two-person race, you would have had just as negative. I mean, four what, mailers a day? People. you what, got to stand out. Well, you, you do, but I think the negativity within those mailers would have been just the same. And, and Jason Barrett brought up a, a great point yesterday. This is going to continue until the standards for the libelist, slanderist um, standards are changed for political candidates. That as long as it's as they are happen. allowed just to make happen. these yeah. these libelous claims, these slanderous claims, they're going to continue. All right, back to you, Joe. Yeah, I, Mike. I, in theory, I agree with you on on uh, Mike Height. I agree with you about boy, the changes in the law would would mean a difference, but uh, I, I don't see that happening. We we've uh, back to. I think New York Times versus Sullivan goes back to the 1970s in terms of what the standards are regarding uh, public figures and, and people running for office are public figures. Uh, I'd like to see it. I mean, we have truth in advertising, right? We all know that concept. A marketer can't come out and just make claims about a product that uh, the, the science or data doesn't support. Uh, yet these politicians can come out and make these spurious claims about people and, and uh you no know, one, no one bats an eye at it. So it, it, it is problematic there. But uh, I, you know, there's a local friend of mine who works in a uh, uh, a job for a um, elected official, pretty uh, prominent elected official, and he's of the belief and has been for many, many years that low voter, voter turnout's not a problem because the people who turn out to vote typically are people who are engaged and understand things. Uh, and, and so he doesn't see it as a problem when uh, folks who have apathy and don't care about uh, the, these politics and these politicians uh, uh, that don't turn out on election day. He doesn't see that as a problem. I, I see it as an overarching problem, which is that we just have too many people that are not engaged who don't understand things, don't make the effort to, to read and learn things. And it's a shame because uh, uh, it, it, we're going to get the government we deserve if we're not going to hold people to certain standards and that we're not going to be able to see the BS from, uh, from reality. But uh, I'm afraid that's where we are, and I think it's only going to get worse because it, it's clear that uh, some of these campaigns have figured out that this stuff is, resonates and works, and they're going to keep doing it. But it's, it, it, it's, it's bigger than just the, the campaigns, though, Joe. It, 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 we've monetized. It used to be back, you know, when, when all of this first started, when television and radio first started, the news departments were not revenue generators. You know, they were the loss leaders that were required by the FCC. Now they are revenue generators. 
And as revenue generators, you know, in, in clickbait, now they have to start generating the stories that bring people in, which then make them tilt the news toward that the, the people want to hear, which means that it's okay to be almost true or to tell the part of the story that eliminates the exculpatory evidence and just just goes toward the the, the drumbeat that goes for your side of the story. So, and, and this is okay now. And so if it's okay for the news media, for the fourth estate, then it has to be okay for the politicians, right? And it has to be okay for my next door neighbor. And that's the only news he's getting is the half-truths that he's receiving. So it's not necessarily that they're uninformed. It's just they're half-informed with the stuff that they want to hear. Well, it's the, the informed ones are either way right or way left. Bill? Yeah, and also the indifference, though, is not, is not limited to education. We hear that all the time, excuse me, limited to voting. We hear it all the time in education, that the, the teachers, the parents are indifference to the, the education the children get in. It's a, the, it's a paradigm and shift of our culture now that uh, we have a different in, involvement than what we had, uh, say, 15, 20, 30 years ago. So. And that'll take us to the end of our first segment. Um, we will be back in just a bit. Welcome back to the second segment of Eastern Pan Am Talk without Rob Mario. I am joined by Delegate Height, Good John morning. Gilstrap. Morning, John. Morning. Mr. Stubblefield. Good morning, there, Mike. Larry Schultz. <laughs> Great to be here. And on the Bye. phone, Joe Ferretti. Joe, are you there? Great to be here. And Great. on the phone, <laughs> Joe Ferretti. <laughs> Joe, are you there? Great to be here. And on the phone, <laughs> Joe Ferretti. <laughs> Joe, are you there? Great to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's on. That might be the wrong one, Mike. <laughs> no, that is it. We'll, we'll get Joe back in a second once we get Colin in here to fix, <laughs> fix the problem. Why don't we go to Mr. Stubblefield <laughs> for the second time? <laughs> Come on, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> here we go. Once again, my Colin. <laughs> somewhere Mario is going laughing. to the left. <laughs> Mario's on the beach somewhere. Joe, just keep it down out there. <laughs> no loop. Mike, this last week, uh, Steve Williams was in. He's a candidate for governor from the, on the Democratic side, and he is he part of his platform is to put abortion on on a statewide referendum. Uh, there are currently three states recently that have had a statewide ref referendum addressing abortion. Kansas, Ohio, and Kentucky. All three approved uh, through a referendum vote uh, for abortion. There are 11 other states that are considering doing it, including such states as Montana, Nebraska, Nevada, Florida, Arkansas, New York, Maryland, like. So a lot of states are showing some interest with this. My question, just a second, is going to be, is this a wise move on uh, Williams' part or not? People would say that there's no reason for this, because there was a 2018 referendum on abortion. But the argument can be made, and I think it's uh, justified, that the 2018 did not really Omit, uh, allow or prohibit abortion. It was mostly about funding. Said state uh, that federal dollars cannot be used to uh, to fund abortion. And the statement reads: Nothing in this Constitution either secures or protects. In other words, both sides of the fence. The the uh, the right of abortion. I think as a Democrat, Williams is going to have to find a niche that will not only shore up his Democrat voters, but carve out some Republican voters that feel strongly that it should be instead of the body of a group of old white men making this decision. It's the, it's the state as a whole, all the voters as a whole weighed in. Is this a wise move on Williams' part? Let's go to Joe on the phone if he's there. I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we got you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Colin. Um, yeah, I think uh, uh, this is probably one of the few issues that Steve Williams has to campaign on in West Virginia because I believe, based on polling that I recall from a couple of years ago, and it might even be back in around 2018, Bill, on the issue of abortion, uh, I think the case could be made that our legislature is a little bit to the right of where the 
general population is in West Virginia on the issue. So uh, Steve Williams has to try to exploit that and argue that uh, he's going to represent a, a little bit more balance to the issue of abortion, that that's what he's gonna represent, and that he's going to guard against what we see some other states doing, uh, where they seemingly are incapable of declaring victory, uh, and they go forward and, and suddenly start going after IVF and going after mifepristone and declaring it a Schedule Four drug, the same as heroin. Uh, you know, those sorts of, of things, which some people would consider to be overstepping, are uh, things that Steve Williams is going to argue, I believe, that he can guard against in West Virginia, and that, that he's gonna have to hope that that resonates with uh, uh, women who are registered as Republicans and others who feel that uh, perhaps the legislature is geared up to, to take us too far to the right on the issue of abortion. I, I think he has to do it because there's not much else he can campaign on in West Virginia. Uh, I don't know that it's going to be a winning strategy, but I, I fully expect him to do it. Michael Height. So uh, it doesn't matter really whether or not you believe abortion should be legal or illegal. That That is irrelevant to this subject. This is about whether or not it's good strategy for Steve Williams to do this. And I think it's very good strategy for, for Williams to do this. He's going to come into this race behind just because he's on the de Democratic side of the ticket. He has to find an issue that is going to define his campaign and and a, an issue that he can get support from 40 or 50 percent of the voters and the ones that are going to come out. And this is an issue that could bring voters out um, that as red as the state of West Virginia is, this is a divisive issue. Um, and it could, you know, I, I don't know what the division is of, of individuals who who um, think abortion should be legal as opposed to illegal. Um, some people say you know, that it's a 50-50 split. I, I don't know. But if it is, it's close to 50-50. That's what makes this a brilliant move on his part is because he needs as many votes as he can get on both sides of the ticket. He should carry you know, 90, 95 percent, if not 100 percent of the Democrats just because he's on that side of the ticket. If he can pull independents and he can pull a few Republicans who this is a big issue for, that, then that's the only way he makes this a competitive race. And I don't know any other subject that that has a 50-50 split like this. Larry? Um, it, it's interesting. What he is proposing is a, I take it, a referendum that if passed will enshrine or protect the right for a woman to choose abortion with her doctor uh, for the reasons that they think are appropriate. And basically, it will be interesting to watch the constitutional fight between the statute, which doesn't say that, and this referendum uh, finish. Somebody will have to pick which one of these is the law of our state. Um, I think the referendum will win out uh, if it's voted on by a majority, but to the extent that the referendum proposes a question uh, making legal something that is illegal today, then you have another uh, sort of state constitutional issue that I think will be resolved pretty quickly um, when, the, when the whole people vote. Um, it's it is something he has to do to make the contrast between the two parties clear. Well, um, let me be clear. There won't be a referendum. That that will not He happen. would run on it. That, that would be his yeah, campaign right. it's, promise. It's absolutely okay. smart for him to run on it. The referendum will never... With a, with a Republican supermajority, you will never see this re referendum. Okay. So it, it is just going to be his issue. Campaign yes. issue. Yes. yes. So yes. he'll propose a statute that repeals the statute that was passed a couple of years ago. Correct. John. <clears throat> Strategically, I, I guess, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in a state that is as red as West Virginia, you, you want to be relevant on something. So I guess this is as good a thing to be relevant on as, as anything. Um, I, I heard Mayor Williams on, on the air and on that, on that interview, 
and he misrepresented some some issues. You know, we were talking about getting back to to the to the other topic. Um, as I understand it, the current uh, abolition of of abortion does not get into does not prohibit saving mothers' lives and, and that sort of thing, which was which was what he was talking about Correct. and that he wants to change. But that's get that's getting into the weeds. I don't. We, I was a big proponent of overturning Roe simply because it was the federal government telling the states what they had to do. So now the states have that ability to decide for themselves what they're going to do. I'm not sure I understand the resistance to allowing then the people within the state to decide what to do. You know, I, I, I kind of believe in, in the power of, of the people. So I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not personally resistant to this going up for a referendum. I mean, why not? Why not have it represent, even if it's codified that there's a, if we're going to have it, then we have it every 10 years so that we represent, you know, how the, the changing uh, mores of, of the community. But what's happened now is with the supermajority, I, what I, you hear these rumbles of constitutional amendments to prohibit abortions. We're hearing that. We heard that from Riley Moore. That's what he's pushing for at, uh, at the federal level. They want to get a constitutional, the, the federal constitution to be amended to prohibit abortion. That's the wrong thing to do. That's just row in reverse. Yes. And yeah. it's, it's, it's wrong headed. So I don't know. Is it a good strategy? I, sh it, I agree. It's never going to happen. Uh, it makes him relevant. I don't understand the knee jerk reaction having won in the Dobbs decision. Dobbs, right? It, uh, having won in the Dobbs decision, I don't understand the resistance then going the next step and saying, well, okay, let the yeah. people decide. Back to Bill. I think it's a good discussion, and uh, and I tend to agree with John Gailstrap that it's uh, uh, let the folks decide and not just uh, uh, have the gatekeepers, which are the supermajority, saying, nope, we know more than what the folks and, and do. And for those that yeah. would uh, push back and say the people already decided by referendum. And that's my point. Yeah. In 2018, I don't think that's, uh, that's, that's, very, that's quite ambiguous in my view that the people actually said that, Mike. What was the results of that? Uh, do you do you know? What, it was overwhelmingly. It was not overwhelming. It was about four or five percent. Four or five. Well, that's yeah, pretty poor. It's very for close. That issue. And again, it was uh, there were two parts to it: the educate the the funding part, and the other one. And I find to be fairly ambiguous language. Nothing in this Constitution secures or protects. Mm -hmm. Actually, you can argue that to both sides of the fence, have what that reads. All right. To the next discussion, we're going to go to the delegate. And uh, Mr. Height, you're up. Well, I'm going to go back to uh, local races. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, turnout. We saw what turnout was in, in the county, and it was pretty low. Um, but we're, we're about two weeks away from a city election. And city elections are, are notoriously um, low turnout. So being that the county turnout was so low, do we expect to see the city turnout be even worse or, or better um, than what the county was and, and why? John. I, <clears throat> truth be told, dealing off the top of the deck here, I have no frame of reference. I, no. I really don't know. Um, my, my best thing, we had, I, I mentioned off the air, we had a contractor at our house yesterday and I asked him who he was likely to vote for. He lives in Martinsburg, actually downtown Martinsburg. Asked him who he was going to vote for, and he said, "Didn't we just have that election?" I said, "No, that was that was for the county." He said, "Oh, I have I have no idea who who's who is the mayor." So, that it, if that's an indicator, I'm going to say low turnout and low yeah. interest. Go to Joe on the phone. Yeah, Mike. I think it's going to be uh, shockingly low turnout, and it's a shame because there are important issues. I, I, I'm a downtown city business. I pay that B&O tax uh, grudgingly every year. I've heard for years how that was going to be reformed or, or done away with, if we could get certain sales taxes that the, the city was able to collect. Uh, we still have the issue with blighted properties uh, downtown and, and absentee landlords and some of these issues which have just been percolating throughout Martinsburg for decades now. Uh, they remain unresolved. Uh, I, you know, I think the mayor has made some strides 
towards uh, addressing some of the, the problems in, in Martinsburg, but there's much work to do. And I think uh, him and, and city council uh, still have their work cut out for them. And uh, I would like to think that city residents and business owners are engaged enough to turn out and vote, but I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, and, and frankly, I, I I just don't see, it, as John Gilstrap related, I don't see a lot of discussions going on about these issues and, and the importance of them uh, to the, the, the residents in, in Martinsburg. And so I expect a, a low voter turnout. It'll be a shame. Uh, and we'll go right back to grumbling about these issues, uh, you know, months later, because, uh, you know, I, I, it's, it's a question of getting the right people in the job and, and, uh, you, there's only one way to do that, and you got to go vote the, those folks in. And I just don't think there's going to be enough people doing that. I, I don't know why they bother to have a separate election. What would be the point of having a second election two weeks after the people just voted? To suppress that's the vote. That's a good vote. point. That, I mean, yeah. it is to it, suppress the vote. It is. <laughs> I mean, that's the... Historically, I don't. I'm not blaming the, the the people that are in there right now, but um, we did have a a bill that we we are trying to make sure all municipalities have to either put their uh, election on a primary or on a general election. Um, and I know the city was said it's because of the year, and then you know, their year starts in July or something like that. Or we, there's no excuses. It needs to be on either a primary or 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 a general. And, and so what you will have is people who are offended, deeply offended by whatever the government has done or done or not done. And you will have people who are related to the candidate. <laughs> and that's your entire voter field. I mean, because you, you could have a ward win with 100 votes. Yeah. yeah I, or, or, I yeah. was <laughs> driving through town the other day. I don't live in Martinsburg. Saw a sign for the mayor's race. And I just assumed, I thought to myself, why the hell didn't he get out here and gather up his signs? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> turns out the election hasn't happened yet. <laughs> Is it the same way in Berkeley Springs? Uh, you know, no? there's so little interest in the town of Bath, I don't even know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think they do have a separate election, which really makes no sense. <laughs> now we're talking about maybe not even triple digits. Yeah. Before the winning candidate. And, and if you look at that across the state of all these small towns, <laughs> it could be you know, my brother, my sister, my uncle voted for me, and I, I'm now the winner. I mean, I went to a rural high school, and there, still there were more votes for homecoming queen than that. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, What's, what brings out to, to folks? folks to vote. Two things basically. One is a strong personality of one of the candidates. I.e. someone like Donald Trump. You like him or don't like him. Strong personality. The other one are the issues. You get, that's, that's what will promote folks to vote. I have no idea what the issues are in Martinsburg. And I'm what someone would call a, a political nut if you will. I enjoy politics. I don't know what the issues are. One way to better understand the issue are uh, through forums or debates. And yet we called two of the candidates out earlier for not participating. One is responding and said they do not see a need to defend themselves to me uh, with, a, with a debate. I don't think it's the issue of defending yourself. It's the issue of trying to address the issues so that people have a better understanding. Showing of, you're informed, showing that you know the issue. So, and how you would react to an issue. People want to find out how you're going to react to an issue. It's not so much looking backward of saying I've done a good job. It's looking ahead of how I would address an issue. Uh, if, we, if people knew if the issues were well defined clear, then debates are probably less important. In this case, they're not well recognized. It's, the debates are very, very important. I would encourage all the candidates to participate, and I'd encourage as many people as they can to follow the debates and to get to understand the issues. Well, not to pick sides here, but the fact that nobody can put their finger on what the issues might be, isn't that indicative of good stewardship and that 
the well, I think you have to live in a city to 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 know those things. I mean, we we can we know what the issues are. I mean, Mike has a business in the city, but he has no voice in in what goes on in the city. He can't vote. But he's got an ear to what's going on. Got an ear. We are all have a, issues. This is a fairly small community. Yeah. It's not like uh, Martinsburg lives in a little cube all by themselves. All of us are involved in the Martinsburg activity. And the fact that we do not understand the issues is, I think, problematic. <clears throat> or recognize the issues is problematic. Or the issues are so minor and do not affect us that... We we don't have any reason to know. Well, I, I, think I, I don't know I think that that's true. I'm not saying it is, but when it comes to the issues, I think most of us don't live in the city, so that's why we don't know what the issues are. So if you live in the city, I, I think there's a they know what the issues are, and I think the issues for the city right now um, center around Lambert Pool. They center around stormwater management fees that have been raised and raised and raised. They center around uh, affordable housing. Um, so those are the issues that I think um, are the big things here in Martinsburg and why you really truly need to have debates and forums so you can see how the incumbent, what his solutions are for rectifying these situations and the challenger and see what her situation is and what her solutions are to rectifying these situations along with those individuals who are going to be elected to city council. Because we have to remember that, that the system in Martinsburg is a weak mayor system and it's the city council that makes the majority of the decisions along with the, well, the city, city manager, city right? manager yeah. that makes a lot of those decisions. It's not the mayor. so. You know, even though the, you're running for mayor and you may have solutions, you still have to get the city council and the administrator um, on board to 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 solve those issues. So uh, that's why I think it's extremely important um, for to have these debates. And if you had these debates and people saw where where you stand on the issues, that may generate more people to the polls. And Ward 1 and Ward 3 generally are the ones who who turn out much, much higher than, than, the, than the other wards. And they generally are the ones who pick the, pick the mayor. And where are those? Is it downtown? Um, it, it's out by uh, Memorial Park, I think, is, is, one. is one. And then on the other kind of, on the other side of Martinsburg, um, more towards New York Avenue, kind of that area. I think New York Avenue is is that is Ward Two. Is that two? Yeah, that's where the maybe see, on the other is. side of King Street then. Okay. Yeah. So right, right on the right. northern part of Martinsburg. Gotcha. In, yeah. So. All right. Um, we are going to take a break, and we will be back after this. We'll come back into Eastern Panhandle Talk without Rob Mario. Um, I'm going to throw a little wrench in the. Um, in the thing here, I wanted to, I'm pulling a mogul. I wanted to get your guys' reaction to the uh, Board of Education not renewing uh, Ron Stevens' contract. And what kind of leader do you think we should be picking moving forward? And I'll start with Joe on the phone. Well, um, not surprised that the board didn't renew the contract. Uh, let's recall, Mike, that... Ron Stevens uh, came in, I think, on a vote of three to two when he was uh, the interim superintendent and then named uh, a little over a year ago as the uh, permanent superintendent for schools in Berkeley County. I believe the vote uh, at the Board of Education was three to two, and I think Pat Murphy and Melissa Power voted against uh, Ron Stevens at that time. So he went into the job, and I think it was you know, a one-year appointment. So. Uh, he went into the job with uh, some questions, and uh, he wasn't on the most solid of footing regarding that job, uh, and clearly became, uh, I guess in some ways, uh, blameworthy with regard to the situation at uh, North Middle School and, and the state having to take over the schools uh, there to, uh, I guess, right the ship. Uh, I saw the interview and listened to it on your station, Mike, uh, with Ron Stevens just a couple of days ago. 
And I have to say, uh, yeah, I like Ron, but I came away from that interview uh, not feeling real confident that he had his finger on the pulse of the problems there at North Middle. It did give me a lot of confidence that, uh, uh, you know, he was going to be somebody who might be able to solve the issues there. So uh, clearly the board saw it that way. And and um, so uh, out he goes. And it's, it's a shame, but it's uh, something that uh, I think the board felt and necessary to do as to who will replace him boy that's uh i mean it, it's a job that pays well i think it pays just south of two hundred thousand dollars a year uh we, we've had uh uh some good superintendents in the past and some questionable ones uh this is going to be a very important hire but i think uh, i would be looking for candidates to come in who have shown a history of taking over troubled school systems and correcting some problems. So that would be an outsider uh, then? I'm sorry? So that would be somebody from the outside of the system? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Um, and I, I don't know if that's always necessary a good thing, but uh, I think in this case, uh, the candidate should have to exhibit some ability to deal with these kinds of problems. And uh, I hope that uh, the, the school board will be looking in that that direction and I hope we get the kind of candidates who have that uh, in their background. So uh, it'll be an interesting but a very important hire going forward. So, Bill. Yeah, uh, one could argue, and I think Ron Stevens would probably argue that he had came into the job with his hands tied behind him. One year contract was is a very short term to get things started. But but I, I, I tend to agree with, with Joe. Uh, the interview we had with Ron this past week was one of a defensive nature. He came loaded with arguments of small nitpicking arguments why, why uh, things were, were, are not as bad as they appear to be. That's not what we need in a leader. We do not need a defensive person as a leader. We need someone that's willing to, to take the full picture on and to try to integrate the strengths and to utilize the strengths to go where we want to go. We, we are using North Middle as an example that something needs to be done. But Pat Murphy, when he was here a couple so weeks ago, showed, to me, a much more disturbing set of statistics. That would be in a middle schools that we rank below the state's average in a lot of the academic uh, criteria, which we know the state is probably the 50th in the nation in a lot of things. When we rank below the rest of the state, we have problems. We have real problems. And, and I'm not sure that we can find a Superman that to address the myriad of problems of the State Board of Education with the, the other factors, but we sure better try. And I don't know who the best candidate is. I don't know if it's going to be in-house, out-of-house, but we better look for the best candidate that our money can buy. Now, we're not going to be able to come up with a $2 million to find somebody. That's, that's unreasonable. But $200,000 is a reasonable amount to try to find a good candidate with this exceptionally challenging job. And I want to give Ron a lot of credit for coming on the program and, and defending it. You know, he didn't have to do that, so I, I, do, I do give him credit for that. John? Uh, correct one thing Jackie Long says on our uh, Facebook page. It's not $200,000. It's not a set fee. It's based on experience. So yep. put that it out It could there. be higher. It could be lower. It could be lower. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I personally like Ron. I think he's a stand-up guy. Uh, the music stopped. He didn't have a chair. There has to be... Uh, somebody has to be held accountable for this. And he is at the top of the pyramid. And I, I think it's the right thing to do, to let him go. I, re I really do. Uh, now, he didn't break the system. No. He was just there when the, when the broken system was discovered. There's a lot of people left behind who are the stewards of the system, who watched it being broken as it was being broken and were not comfortable watching it being broken, but then also didn't do enough to fix it as, as it went along. I don't know what they could have done. That's not my job to know what, what could have been done. So who's the next person that they hire in? It's somebody who comes in with the attitude, the next son of a so-and-so who tells me that they can't fix this, that they don't have the authority they're fired. 
the net, you you going to we're pulling we're going to make this happen. This our statistics suck in a state whose statistics suck. We can be better than the state's 43%. Let's go, let's shoot for a champion 44%. You know, and you might not achieve it, right? But that's the leadership we need. You know, we're not, failure is not an option here, folks. So if you're going to show up in your office and just stick in your office and type on your computer and do whatever administrative thing that you do every day and you think you're not going to go out into the school, into the schools and actually get dirty and fix things and see the disciplinary actions that are being taken, make note and come up with solutions, you're in the wrong job. That's the leader we need. Larry. Yes. One of the big problems, as I understood what I read about <laughs> North Middle School, is that a huge percentage of the teachers there are not certified teachers. They are long-term substitutes. If the certification of a teacher means something, and we all as a state agree that it does, because that's why we have it, then uncertified teachers, it's like saying, you know, I own this giant apartment complex, and in half of it, the plumbing is terrible. <laughs> well, we don't have any licensed plumbers, so we've just been hiring guys off the street to see if they can, they can fix it. You need the certified teachers. And I don't know who, nobody local, is ever going to have the power to say, okay, we're raising the price and we're going to go over to Maryland and we're going to get the certified teachers who left here in the last 20 years and we're going to bring them back here and we're going to pay them what we think they deserve to be paid regardless of what the state says. If you can't make that kind of fix, then whoever this superintendent is who's coming in is being set up to fail unless you know and and again the, we have to there are things that we can't do and we can't manufacture money right so think outside the box i am not qualified to teach creative writing at the high school level because i'm not a certified teacher and this is i'm not volunteering to try okay <laughs> but one would argue that if there's a retired engineer who wants to teach math but is not a certified math teacher, maybe we should give him a shot, right? So what we do instead is we get these permanent uh, substitutes who are also not uh, certified. certified, but they're also like 22. <clears throat> so there are, there are school systems that reach out to accomplished retirees who have knowledge and capabilities. They might not, they might teach the math the way they learned it, which then isn't with the pedagogy of, of current teaching skills, but the kids are going to learn and they're not going to be able to bust the heads the way that they, <laughs> that they learned back when, when they were doing it. There are ways around these problems. We just need to bring in imagination to solve it. It's just to me, if we are not prepared to put the personnel in place, I mean, imagine the moon landing. Of the space program. Well, you know, it'd be awful nice to have a bunch of trained engineers, but we don't have the money for that, so we'll get retired bus drivers to get it all set up, because they do know about moving people around. Uh, we're not going to get there. We don't get to the moon with the retired bus drivers. <coughs> I, I, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't. <laughs> I see your point. I, I don't know if I'm going to go there. You know, Ron's situation is, you know, Anytime something like this comes up, um, you have to look at who's responsible for it, and um, you naturally look at the top. Now, whether you blame Ron for this or not, he's at the top, he's the top dog, and ultimately the buck stops there. And so I am not surprised that they did not renew his contract. Um, and, and maybe Ron didn't focus on what needed to be focused on. I, I think when you look at the middle schools, though it's interesting that they come in in their sixth grade year their scores are still below what the west virginia standard is and west virginia's standard is pretty low so it seems to me like this starts way before they get to middle school this is there's a problem in the intermediate school and we need to be addressing that because it, it seems like we're, we're pretty good up to like third grade 
Um, but it's after that that we start decreasing. And even when they get into middle school, if you look at the statistics, they come in and the, and the, the statistics are bad and they get steadily worse as the years go on. In the seventh grade year, it's worse than the sixth grade year. The eighth grade year is worse than the seventh grade year. So is it, is it because the kids lost something in the intermediate years? And maybe that's what needs to be addressed. I think some of the issues, and we talked a little bit about this offline, is my opinion is, and it's all my opinion is, there's a discipline issue. And, and when you hire whoever the next superintendent is, I think it needs to be a disciplinarian. You have to, whatever they are allowed to do by law, discipline-wise, they need to affect that. Because if, if you have unruly children in the classroom, nobody learns. It's not just the unruly ones that don't learn. It's the ones that are trying to pay attention. And you're taking education away from them. And I know as from the legislature point, we've tried to run bills that, that removes those individuals from we're, the classroom. We're trying to untie the hands of the educators to yeah. give them the tools that they can sure. then use. And, and, and then there's some concerns, you know, if you remove them from the classroom, what do you do with them? It's, you know, do you put them in another classroom and who takes care of them there? We're already shorthanded. So there's there's a lot of issues to address but to me it starts with the discipline you cannot have unruly classrooms it even if they're not a certified teacher as john points out they still may have something to offer and they still may be a good teacher even if they're not certified but if you put an unruly child in there or or several unruly children in there there's no way they're going to be able, I don't care if they are certified, they're not going to be able to teach. And and one unruly child that is not disciplined leads to two and leads to three and leads to four because they look at each other and they see, well, if he can cross the line not and get in trouble, then I can cross the line. And, and they keep pushing the line farther and farther away to where these teachers have lost total control of their classrooms and in North Middle School they've lost total control of the school so who's responsible? You have to look at the top and and right now that's Ron Stevens unfortunately and it seems like we're always reactive to this because we we had this issue a couple of years back we had to do that Um, but I I don't want to beat a dead horse I I, want to make another point though we're talking about leadership the leadership now has shifted to the Board of Education that they're going to have the opportunity and the responsibility to up to fulfill what they've been paid to do. They've got a tremendously important appointment and decision to be made, whether it's going to be a permanent. Uh, they're going to have to do it quickly. they got to do it quickly. So they may have to go with temporary. Regardless of what they have to do, they're going to have to really get their act in order, and they've got to, they've got to come at it full bore. So that's where the leadership resides now. That's where the spotlight resides. That's where the responsibility will rest. Also, <clears throat> Jeff Haddix here on Facebook brought up a really good point. If we can send thousands of kids home during a pandemic and have their ki- their parents take responsibility, then we can send a few unruly kids home for the benefit of the majority. Absolutely. That's a really, but, really good point. But what we, I think we're making the mistake of trying to address a problem in isolated silos. This, All these problems need to be integrated and addressed in total. And that's where you have to have the right, right superintendent. And it's going to take a cut above. And that's, that's why we need to look both internal and external and get the best one we can pay for. Well, but what are you looking for? That's what concerns that's me. What when the, when yeah. we're looking for a superintendent, what are we looking for? And so the, the board has an important decision to make about the 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 kind of superintendent right. yeah. that they're going to choose. Yeah, I, I think exactly. legislatively we need to give, we need to pass that discipline bill. We need to give the elected BOE more power. And, and you need to put Amendment 4 back, back, on, the on, the, back on the ballot we will by, try. Itself. Yep, by, by itself. By itself. Yeah. And one of, the, and one of the, the other things, one of the, the major complaints from teachers, and uh, along with, with pay, but one of the major ones, even above pay a lot of times, is, the, is discipline and the lack of support from, from their administration, administration the people above them. Within that school. Because yes. obviously they don't want to well, report the school, yeah. the, within the school and the board of education. Yeah. All right, next topic, Mr. Schultz, you're up. Yes, um, we've recently seen um, a campaign 
video go up from the Trump folks um, where they kind of <laughs> slipped up and included a, a sort of fake news article um, that talked about America having a unified Reich. Uh, that's R-E-I-C-H, as in Third Reich. Um, they then when they discovered it. They immediately took it down when they discovered that word because even they understood that using a German word for government might not be all that uh, easy to, to handle. Um, this is as close as any politician has ever been in my entire life um, to... And, and, you know, there's the speech comments about vermin and, and all the other sort of you know, taken from uh, Hitler's memoirs uh, language that he uses. Uh, uh, do they really think that this is going to draw an, appreci an appreciable number of new voters more than what they're going to lose? I mean, you know, I think I'm probably fairly typical. I had a couple of great uncles who gave their all against the, uh, the Germans in World War II. And... Um, and um, a couple of others who were wounded but made it home. And it's, uh, that's a pretty offensive thing. And I don't see how there's this sort of, oh, well, you know, these sorts of things happen sort of attitude about it. It drives me a little crazy, actually, to see it. So I, I wonder, have we crossed a line here, John? <clears throat> That far right-wing news rag called PBS um, reports. <laughs> Come on, John. That's, a, that's an offensive thing to say. <laughs> the 30-second video that you're referring to appeared Monday on Trump's account at a time when the presumptive Republican nominee for president, while seeking to portray President Joe Biden as soft on anti-Semitism, has himself repeatedly faced criticism for using language and rhetoric associated with Nazi Germany. It was posted and shared on the former president's Truth Social account while he was on a lunch break from his Manhattan hush money trial on Monday afternoon. On Tuesday morning, the post of the video had been deleted. This was not a campaign video. It was created by a random account online and was reposted by a staffer who clearly did not see the word while the president was in court, Caroline Levitt, the campaign press secretary, said in a statement. So this was not posted by the campaign. This was posted by a third party while nobody was paying attention to it, and it was taken down within hours. So, so this is not a drumbeat from the administration. You can argue as whatever you want, but this is, this is not... We were talking before, right? We're telling the truth. This is this is not what the campaign is shaping itself to be. This is what a third party perceives the campaign to be. Or it's what a troll is portraying the but, campaign to be. But how does, first of all, it wasn't a troll who used the word vermin. That was Donald Trump That's himself. what we're talking about right now. But, it's not expand well, the it's discussion. it's the same thing. <laughs> well, no, that also was in a different context, but... Um, uh, the real problem, it seems to me, is so his campaign um, account on Truth Social, which I got to tell you, I've never, never logged on to see what any of that is, is open to anybody who might want to post pro-Nazi videos. It's just uh, like any other social media. Yeah, you can post to anybody's account. Um, that's a little, uh, that's a little troubling too, but I you, thought You can't this, stop people from posting to your account as a politician either. That's illegal. But that was a, that was a, um, a campaign staffer who pulled it down. So they are reviewing it. It's a random person put it up. A campaign staffer saw it and took it down. Okay. So they have the power to. Yeah. They did the right thing. So what you actually eventually. saw was, yeah. what you actually saw was the Trump campaign seeing a bad thing done, reacting and taking it down. In what, 12 or 14 hours? Yeah. I don't I yeah. don't know that anybody I, counted I the mean, hours. I just don't see how this keeps happening. I think you These saw a story I think up. you saw a story that resonated with what you wanted it to be. Well, well let's get a Joe on the phone. Want, I don't want let's a Nazi get. to be president. Well, I don't <laughs> I think really he's don't. a Nazi. Let me be clear about that. Joe, your reaction? 
Well, I, you know, I don't know the, the specifics regarding this post. I, I did see the reports that it was done, and, and you know, it mentioned the word Reich, which we understand is, is somewhat of a a questionable uh, term to, to use. But the bottom line is that this is just part of the the, the deal with Donald Trump. Uh, he'll say things, uh, he'll espouse beliefs, opinions, and then it's left to his minions to come back and clean up in some sort of re-engineering campaign to say, oh, this is what he really meant. This is, you know, this is what he, he's really saying as opposed to, uh, you know, what, what the plain meaning of his language is, such as yesterday in the Bronx when he's telling uh, blacks and Hispanics that they're being slaughtered by the million by illegal immigrants. I mean, come on. <laughs> It's rhetorical speech that's over the top. He's been guilty of this going back before when he before he was president, when he claimed that the sitting U.S. president was not a U.S. citizen and had had the goods on him and had the information and had his birth certificate and all this, which was just nothing but, pardon the expression, fake news. So, you know, this is just part and parcel of who he is. Uh, and, and we have to accept that. It resonates with a large part of the American citizenry. Um, I, I can sit here and question why, but it does no good. Uh, a lot of people are in his camp. A lot of people believe that the economy was so great under him and we need a restoration of those days. Uh, and, and that's why they're going to vote for him, regardless of the baggage and regardless of the fact that he's sitting in a courtroom after having paid off a porn actress. Uh, we, we just bat an eye at that and then move on. And, and that's that's where we are. Uh, you you guys the other day, you know, questioned uh, the situation about how Governor Justice is so popular in this state with the baggage that he carts around daily. Uh, there, there's not a day goes by that I don't read a report about somebody slapping a lien on his assets because he owes people money. Uh, so uh, you, know, you wonder at some point, up at home, I don't know when that day is. I don't think we're going to see it. And and we see, uh, uh, you know, former President Trump with, with a, a, a very strong following. He's a very viable candidate in the fall. Uh, and uh, some people are going to be happy and some people are going to be uh, uh, totally apoplectic about it. But the bottom line is that uh, this is just part and parcel of who he is. And uh, that's been accepted. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, this is going to sound very Pollyannish, uh, but we live in such a divisive, very polarized world with silos. We listen to what we want to hear. I've gotten to the point that I try to disregard any inflammatory l labeling put on either one of the two candidates. And I'm a little disappointed that we're spending 15 to 20 minutes and just feed into this device, divisive rhetoric that we see all around us. Uh, yeah, you can read anything you want to into this. You can, there's thousands and thousands of other examples on both sides of political <clears throat> aisle you can read. We can get caught up in this language and forget about the important thing. The important things are the issues. How they're going to address the issues. And I'm less concerned about the labeling where someone made a statement, then it develops, and it's on both sides of the aisle. Someone makes a statement, and then the other side builds it up by throwing timber on top of timber on top of timber, watching the fire grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Mr. Height, I'd have to agree with you, Bill. Um, I don't look at so much of what they're saying as... The, what they're doing, their, their policies. And I don't know whether Donald Trump um, wrote the, the word Reich in his statement or whether it was somebody else. Um, and But to me, it, it's a stretch to go from the word Reich to now Donald Trump is Hitler. And, and because, I, I, like Bill said, I look at what they do and I look at what the right's doing right now. And, and it's not the right that is calling for the slaughter of the Jews like Hitler did. It is, it is the left. It is the left who are, are marching in these colleges and universities um, yelling from the river to the sea, which is a motto that calls for the extermination of the Jews. 
And, and that's not the right. That is not Donald Trump doing that right now. So it's a, it's a stretch for me, for me especially, somebody that doesn't like Donald Trump or anything he says. It's a stretch to equate the word Reich to Donald Trump being like Hitler. That, I, I, don't, I don't make that equate. So I don't see where this word means anything. I look at what they're doing. I look at what the, the Biden administration is doing, the policies and where that has gotten us. And I look back at what Donald Trump did and the policies and where we were there. As much as I dislike Trump, I prefer the policies. I prefer where we were under his administration. Um, and I'm going to vote for him again, if for no other reason than to make him go away in four years. <laughs> Back to you, Larry. you got 60 seconds before I break. Sure. Um, the difficulty that I have with this is that Nazi rhetoric or, you know, pro-German World War II style rhetoric is something that has been absolutely and totally forbidden in our presidential campaigns since the days of Hitler. And we fought a big war over it and, and thousands and thousands of Americans had their lives changed forever as a result of this. Not to mention what happened to the Jews. So it, it is a real sensitive issue. And if there's a, people out there on the Trump side who are trying to sensitize or desensitize our reaction to it, I'm here to say, at least in this household, you're going to fail. Because <laughs> that's, that's big time stuff. And with that, we're going to take our last break of the day, and we'll be right back. And welcome back to Eastern Panhandle Talk. It is the Friday crew. Uh, Joe, why don't you go ahead and plug the, uh, the, the firm since you are the only sponsor for the day. Oh, well. Uh, why not? I'll send you the bill. Don't worry. <laughs> and you look really good for 115. <laughs> I have to say, I'm very impressed. I mean, the amount of this bill, I should get the next 20 minutes. To plug this <laughs> <laughs> You're making uh, up well, for a loss of a lot of political ads, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> well, uh, Mike, I appreciate it. Uh, we are uh, located at 408 West King Street in downtown Martinsburg, where we pay B&O taxes uh, faithfully. <laughs> and uh, we... Uh, uh, certainly handle cases involving personal injury, insurance claims, and the like. If you have any questions about that, you can contact us at 304-264-8505 or visit us on the web at wvjusticelawyers.com. So, Joe, if you win a giant case, do you have to pay 1% of that case to b &O? Uh We pay 1% of gross revenues. Oh, my Lord. Okay. To the city of Martinsburg. Well, they are profiting handsomely. Yeah, fun times. Yeah. All right. So for our next topic, we're going to go to John. All right. Um, a buddy of mine, Claude Barabee, he was on, on the show here on Monday. Um, he's tangentially involved with the shipbuilding business. And uh, it got me talking, looking into the, the industrial structure of the United States and the decay over time that has happened to our industrial base and our ability actually ultimately to defend ourselves, not just in the shipbuilding business, but in producing steel and, and, and what have you. So I did some research here that, you know, at the time that we are so distracted by social issues and about all this, you know, what, what pronouns and all this, to, the, these sort of things, um, our industrial capacity has, has absolutely come apart. And shipbuilding alone, the United States Navy estimates that it is 20 years, 20 years behind in maintenance work. China owns 46.6% of the world shipbuilding market. The United States owns, China's 46.6%. We are 0.13%. China has over 2,000 shipyards. We have five. Car we talk about cargo ships, freight Cargo liners. ships, warships, the yeah. whole nine yards. We have five total for all of these. And this is reflected into manufacturing in general. We don't have backup. Uh, manufacturing anymore that we used to have. So, and that talent pool is leaving because we're not, we're no longer emphasizing 
trades in schools anymore. This is what we talked about here in, in West Virginia. You know, why don't we have more trade schools and what have you? I know I'm kind of hitting a lot of you with, with this cold, but this is, a, this is a concern of mine because you, you project out 20 years, we're going to have a lot of people who can, can write computer programs, but we're not going to have anybody who can mine the, the things we need to have or can design the equipment to mine the things we have to hear domestically. And what that does is it shifts all of, we will become so dependent upon other nations, particularly the ones who are our enemies. We are so dependent upon China. And I, I, I will postulate it's for a discussion, perhaps China is our, I would say our current enemy but it is certainly our future enemy. We depend on them for so much, we need to try to find a way to bring that back. Discuss, how do we do this? Bill. Yeah, uh, John, you're raising an issue with multi, multi facets to it. Uh, one is the maintenance of our military. That does not have as much to do with the shipyards as it does with the dollars going in from the military for our infrastructure. And unfortunately, not as much as going in to either maintain or build new ships as what it should. We will be, I think, the only only area that we surpass China now is in submarines, nuclear submarines. And we're being overtaken by China in this arena. We still have the advantage for the next decade, but after that, it's going to shift to China. As far as the shipyards, very few, I think, and I, I'm, I'm not 100% certain on this, but I believe I'm right. Very few of our large commercial ships, cargo ships, are built in the U.S. In fact, I would say probably none of them. The, our shipyards are for the smaller, air, smaller vessels and the military vessels. We build all of the military vessels with the U.S. shipyards. But the, uh, uh, the large, uh, large cargo ships are built in either South Korea, China, Germany has some shipyards. Denmark, Denmark perhaps. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm dated on all this information. But we do have, going back to your basic question, John, I feel that we have problems in a lot of fronts. One, we do not have the shipyard capability in the time of war to do anything more than to maintain our military ships. During the Second World War, we had the advantage. We were able to uh, crank out the, the Liberty ships at, I think, something like four or five or six a day, maybe a week, uh, four or five or six a week, uh, these Liberty ships. And they were the backbone of our commercial uh, uh, infrastructure, commercial uh, uh, involvement uh, in anything overseas. We've, we're losing that right now. And uh, uh, we're losing our, our capability, I think, to really, because of dollars, to maintain our military components. So it's a multi-problem. I'm not sure that we're doing, we're even thinking about trying to address it. I'm going to go to Joe on the phone. Well, as somebody who grew up in the shadow of steel mills in western Pennsylvania, whose father and uncles worked in the steel mills and watched those steel mills close in the 1970s and 80s because of foreign competition, steel from Japan and Korea uh, that was heavily government subsidized. We're, we're facing the same issue today, John, with regard to our uh, industry the, the, the hard goods industries, uh, the manufacturing and, and the steel and, and the automobiles and things of that nature. Uh, the problem we have is that these other countries heavily subsidize their industry. Uh, look at the electric vehicle issue that's confronting us now. My brother's uh, a, a big wig in, in Ford Motor Company and he's complaining about the fact that we're about to get flooded with Chinese electrical cars because the Chinese government is basically uh, underwriting the, the whole enterprise in that country. But aren't we underwriting it here, too? Uh, to, to a small extent, yeah, with incentives and things like that, Mike. Yeah. But we're not actually sending money to Ford and GM to build EVs. We're incentivizing the, the public to buy them with tax rebates and things of that nature. But uh, it's not a direct transfer of money to the manufacturers themselves. 
So it, it, that's a different ball game, and and that's where um, the, the problems lie. And that happened in the seventies and eighties. The the Japan steel making companies were heavily subsidized by Japan, and we couldn't compete, and so the mills closed. Um, it, it, you know, one answer is uh, President Trump imposed tariffs on uh, on Chinese goods to a great extent. Now economics. Uh, specialists argue that those those costs are just passed down to the consumer, so they really don't work. Uh, I saw President Biden just uh, impose some tariffs on Chinese goods also, including EVs. So uh, it, it takes, a, unfortunately, because we're faced with government subsidies abroad, it takes a governmental response here locally. Uh, I'm interested in the upcoming presidential campaign. This is one issue I'm going to be looking at. What are the prescriptions from the two candidates to deal with foreign competition that is underwritten by foreign governments? Uh, I want to know how we're going to deal with that uh, so that we can perhaps still have an industrial base in this country. Uh, so that, that's one issue this voter is going to be uh, focused on. And I think uh, the use enemy for China is really not. It's more competitor is, is what I what I, I disagree. Say. Yeah, I disagree. It's good, Larry. Yeah, um, there's an interesting now that we're talking a little bit about EVs. There's an interesting thing. You know, the United States of America basically has zero lithium mines, very little, if any. Yeah, if and recently California. they have discovered that of all things. Fracking wastewater in Pennsylvania is rich in lithium. It washes the lithium out of the rock deep under the soil. And now this terrible, awful, environmentally uh, gangrenous product will actually have a value. So we have an opportunity here to get in the battery business in this country without having to rely upon other nations. That will... Um, give us growth that the uh, these other countries won't be able to touch. Um, so, uh, you know, I sure hope it's full speed ahead to figure out how we can use this stuff and keep it after it's done, done being mined for its lithium from killing us um, <laughs> by storing it somewhere. Um, but the the poison is already there. It's in the ground all through Pennsylvania, and uh, to get it back out. But it's not uh, would not be that tough. It's not concentrated. No, it's not. And uh, we have rare earth minerals up in you know, near our, co our coal mines and our old, old coal fields. So I think uh, that's an opportunity for West Virginia down the road. Michael Hike. Well, uh, to get back to the shipbuilding, yeah. um, I think this has been going on for years and years and years. This the the, the actual decline, and I think it goes back to um, the cost of labor to do these things. And when when the companies that are actually building these ships, whether it's governments or private industry, when they're looking to to build ships, they are they are looking to to do it as cheap as possible so the the labor force is one of the big reasons we don't do it here in america anymore then you can you can send it overseas to china or wherever and get a, a much cheaper labor force cheaper materials everything um it, it has really affected our military because if we ever do have to go to war like we did in world war ii our ability to change directions uh, within our industry and started building more planes or, or more ships or whatever is, is hampered. I think we have gotten to a point where we look at technology as being better than quantity. And, and to a degree that is correct, that we have a, an aircraft or a ship that is much more advanced than um, the people that, that we're competing against whether it be the Chinese or or the Russians or whomever so we th seem to think that you know one technolog technologically advanced uh, aircraft or or ship is better than the three to five that they may have so and, and then you bring the drones into it and so there's a lot of that where we're, we're focusing on technology as opposed to quantity now when it gets right down to it I think our ships 
you talk about the maintenance you still have to maintain what we have and i think there was an effort back in in the obama administration to reduce the level of ships in the navy and because i, I believe it was his thought that it was antiquated we don't we don't need all these ships so we don't need to have shipbuilding capability because that is that is the warfare of the past and it's just not needed at the same level that it is today. So we have gone down in, in our, our level of ships within our Navy. We're going through two transitions, and Mike, you, you mentioned one. One transition is going from our internal combustion engine to EVs in, as far as automobiles. And this is a painful period, but it's going to be a transition. The other one is our warfare of the future. The conventional warfare, the, our military leaders said, will not fight another war the same way we fought the last war. It's going to be more drones. Do you invest as China's doing in the conventional aircraft or do you mar start migrating toward drones? But Bill, don't we have way more 6th generation, 7th generation fighter jets, uh, aircraft carriers, submarines than any other nation like well, as I said earlier, uh, as far as the aircraft themselves, I don't, I do not know. As far as aircraft carriers, we're just about China is, is I think, parity with what we have as far as aircraft carriers. I believe I'm right. I, I think they're but, building them, but yeah, we, I think we have almost but triple the, one, the amount. The one, the area that we do have advantage, as I mentioned earlier, is that of submarines, yeah, uh, especially nuclear powered nuclear, submarines, nuclear, nuclear powered, powered submarines, aircraft yeah, carriers. Exactly, we do have. A advantage there uh, but uh, uh, but that we think expect that advantage to go away probably in the next 15 to 20 years but that carries us back full circle what is going to be the future warfare is it going to be dependent upon convention or is it going to be drones the lesson we learn over and over again but never actually learn is that we fight the war yes. that our enemies choose because we don't get to start them. That's that's not who we are. Yeah. So we end up fighting. We gear up for a certain kind of warfare, and then we're in the mountains of Tora Bora, fighting like it's World War One. You know, with some for, with extra technology. You know, it's, so we we never actually fight. It seems to me we're often caught off guard fighting the war that we're not really prepared for. For years, we were prepared to stop the Soviets. Right from crossing in, yeah. in, into Europe. That's what everything was geared for. We have we're ready for thermonuclear war, with limited engagements with with conventional warfare. Well, it turns out, thank God, that that's not that's not the way things work. So and so, my concern through all of this is that we're allowing this decay to happen as and it's and it's a political issue and it does actually become I don't want to say it's not liberal conservative. It's a priorities issue. We are spending trillions on posturing you know it's it's great to we're forgiving i don't know how many billions we have spent forgiving student debt you know it's probably a drop in the bucket overall but we're concentrating on getting votes for people who are making like one hundred thirty-seven thousand dollars a year is the, is the number i heard on average for the people who, whose, whose debts are being forgiven but we're not training tradesmen um so so what's happening is as we're we want to be first in the, the, the Green New Deal. We want to be first in making sure we have the most environmental regulations, but we're not all that interested in being first in manufacturing. And when the next balloon goes up, or when, when, when the bad thing happens, and we do get cut off from our supply chains, because who wouldn't want to do that? I mean, if China decides they want, they want to go to war with us, they're going to cut off the, the vaccines that we're dependent on them for. They're going to cut off the steel that we're dependent on them for. So as a nation, it seems to me that we're totally devoid of imagination. That we, and not only are we dependent on other nations, we're dependent on other nations that we know have a high likelihood of being our future combatants. So why are we putting pressure on our politicians to say, this, this is where we need to be. Why the, the, the politicians are not having this difficult conversation because then you get labeled a warmonger and, and, you, and you don't care about people. You would care about killing people. Well, that's what the rest of the world is, is, is concerned about. Is but isn't us. that what we just did? What, wasn't Joe Manchin on the, uh, wasn't he just saying that's what we did by, by selling these arms and all, all our things over to Ukraine and Israel so that we could invest in the future of our, 
um, infrastructure. Well, but, but that's fine. But we're not building the we're not building the bombs and ammunition to refill. Yes, we, we are. Yeah, yeah, we, well, are. we are. But, yes, we are, but yes. not at the same rate. Right. Uh, we're depleting fa- the gifts yeah. to foreign nations, and that's great. I'm not saying we shouldn't do no, that. I think but it, we're not we're not replacing at the same rate that we're depleting. Well, but I think the view is is do you need to? So you, you're, you're, a lot of what you're talking about is a one to one that China is going to yeah. overtake us. You know, one ship to one ship, one bomb to one bomb, one aircraft to one aircraft, and I think that the position that our nation is taking, right or wrong is that the technology, technological advancement is better than having the one-to-one. One, one super plane is better than having three or four substandard planes. And one super ship is better than having three or four substandard ships. Yeah, what was but, that airplane that was at the air show? The, yeah. the F... Um, 35, whatever it was. But uh, we've got F-65s so that we haven't even seen yet. Where we really need to be concerned is Taiwan with the chip industry. Unless the, the chip act that, that Biden pushed through a couple so years or so ago was a major step in the right direction. But do we have enough time I would agree. before, before uh, China takes over Taiwan? If that happens before well, we have a chip industry and going, we're Nvidia, in a lot of trouble. I mean, and, and and let's also get back to the best and the brightest. The crew of the USS Gerald R. Ford, which I don't know how many billions of dollars have been spent on that over how many years it's been there, it can't get out of port. It's just it's so it's it's got so much technology that everything is breaking. Nobody knows how to fix it. So we spent you know gojillions of dollars on this thing. It's very technologically technologically advanced. It just can't fight a war. And the literal ships, uh, yeah, the, literal the coastal ships, ships yeah. another example. Yep. Well, we see uh, any last comments. We've got uh, about two minutes. Mr. Hike. Well, not about this subject, but I nope. will say, you know, Memorial Day's coming up. Be careful out there and uh, keep your uh, keep your mayonnaise uh, salads on ice and uh, have fun. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I want to applaud the Badger for taking up for the Eastern Panhandle in the last session. You did well. Well, well, thank you, sir. We don't know about that. Yeah. Well, you don't. <laughs> we had to keep him on a leash a little bit, and then he got beat back down a little bit. But he's, the badger he's, did come out, though. Yeah, the session. badger was definitely I mean, out. Was, Joe, any last thoughts? Well, I, I'm just, you know, based on the, the special session just had and, and what transpired there, I, I hope there's not a feeling. And I, I guess I pose this as a question to the two mics this morning. I hope there's not a, a feeling that we have solved some of the issues at DHHR. That seems to be uh, an a, a ongoing problem that's going to take probably a, a, a quite a few sessions. No, this is like solve. a glacier. We're just uh, we're, we're an onion. We're just peeling back the first layer, I think. Is the, yeah, uh, that, that's, I, and I'm glad that that's the attitude because uh, it's quite a large onion. John, last thoughts. Come see, to me, Mar- see me tomorrow at 1 o'clock at the train station in Shepherdstown for a book event. Larry? Um, it's been great to be back with you all. I think we need to maybe substitute Mr. Mario out once in a while. <laughs> but do bring him back. Pump it up a little. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm sure my Three, phone will be lighting two, up. Yeah. One. Thank you very much. We'll see you on Tuesday.